Hello, and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Farmland Raptors with Bracken Brown, Hawk Mountain's naturalist and biologist. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us, Bracken. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and we are so glad you're joining us this afternoon. Thank you. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, we simply could not do what we do without your support. So thank you so very much. If you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges, and we are thrilled to offer our community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on any donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We designate a time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that Bracken Brown is joining us today after spending the week in the field doing some awesome scientific research to join us and share with us his expertise on farmland raptors. Before we get started, I'd love to share some of Bracken's background experience with our audience. Growing up in the valley below Hawk Mountain, Bracken was fortunate to be given the opportunity to funnel his love of birds into collecting data for science. From the age of six, he has been volunteering primarily with Hawk Mountain and has held field positions that have led him to witness many migratory corridor corridors, the species they host, and the researchers who follow them. With an eye on the sky, Bracken is always excited by the challenges and their solutions in collecting and presenting scientific data. Bracken, how did you become involved in the field of avian science? I was really lucky, Jamie, because actually Hawk Mountain Sanctuary uh, had their American Kestrel project and one of their radio tracked birds actually uh, went down on my family's farm. <laughs> And when they showed up to ask permission to go retrieve the uh, tracker, they invited me along. And as a six-year-old, I thought that was very exciting. And then they uh, invited me to join them to ban some kestrel nestlings, uh, which was phenomenal. And I've been volunteering or working for the sanctuary ever since. And the rest is history, right, Bracken? <laughs> Absolutely. So what is one of the most surprising things that you have discovered while working with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary? Um, I'd have to say one of the most surprising things is um, how many people in our immediate area don't necessarily realize what a phenomenal resource is right up the ridge here at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Um, I'm always impressed when I'm out on the lookout uh, sharing the fall migration with people, how many have said, hey, we never really realized this was here or an option before so I'm always excited to get people engaged um, and even if it's just uh, email communication someone has a hot question it's always great to connect with the population so it's always surprising to me how many people don't realize the resource we have right here on our own backyards. Thank you Bracken. All right I think we're all ready to learn more about farmland raptors. I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Jamie. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so I'm very excited to uh, share one of our ongoing research projects, the Pennsylvania Farmland Raptor Project. Um, through the course of today's presentation, I'm gonna give you sort of a background on why we chose the species we did, why there's a need for us to monitor and collect the data we're collecting, and how you, the participants, especially if you're in Pennsylvania, can contribute to uh, our ongoing project. 
Why Pennsylvania? Uh, that made sense because Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is of course located here in southeastern Pennsylvania. So uh, you have to be realistic with your time and resources. Uh, so focusing on our home state, we hope that other states down the road will maybe adopt our model and expand uh, data collection for these species of raptor. And of course, uh, the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, the first of its kind on the globe. It started off as a raptor shoot site, and, and this is pictures from 1933 on Hawk Mountain. Uh, once it was bought and turned into the first raptor sanctuary by Rosalie Edge, uh, we've been con promoting conservation through research and also through education. So there's a huge education component of this project. And of course, our founder, Rosalie Edge, always said the time to save a species is while it is still common. So one of our ongoing missions is collect as much data as we can about all the raptors, even if they're the most common one around, uh, because you can't implement effective management unless you have the information to back uh, your resources. So that leads us to Pennsylvania farmland raptor. Uh, the Landscape of Pennsylvania has changed quite dramatically through the last hundred years, even uh, from the charcoal region or uh, charcoal era, where uh, a lot of our trees were taken down. That opened up a lot of agricultural lands and grasslands, so that promoted a lot of these species utilizing the area. Whereas, if you look out the window today, you're probably going to see a lot more trees than there were. Um, so that is going to impact the raptors uh, that are using the landscape. So we focused on four species that rely on grassland or agriculture uh, within the state of Pennsylvania. And a raptor is an excellent indicator of the ecosystem. Some people say it takes a village. Well, in all species cases, it takes an ecosystem. And raptors are an excellent indicator of the health of the ecosystem because it relies on a lot of other species to actually support, especially if it, it's a bird that's breeding in the area. So it needs a stable food supply from the secondary consumers, primary consumers. So raptors act as an excellent bio indicator for the health of the ecosystem around them. So they're a very valuable uh, scientific tool depending on the scope of your project. So farmland raptor is definitely under our education for conservation success. And we rely on engaging the public to conserve raptors. We are a relatively small team at Hawk Mountain. We hope you'll come out and join us and become one of our members or part of the, our raptor family. And then you can take everything you know and learn with us and implement it in your own backyard because unfortunately we just don't have the resources to expand uh, consistent data collection throughout the state. So we rely heavily on the collaborative effort um, and this requires funding and data collection through collaboration. So here's just some of the funders. Uh, as always, if you would like to support our project, we would love a monetary donation or uh, keep sending your sightings if you're already doing so. We really appreciate your commitment to us. So uh, there are a bunch of other species of grassland birds. Uh, two of them are shown here, the Eastern Meadowlark and the Bobolink, two very charismatic species that have seen significant uh, reduction in their range in the past Bunch of years. So this is using these two maps are for each of the species and it's just indicating uh, changes between breeding bird censuses. So each state spends about five years typically. They grid out the entire state, collect intensive surveys to determine what species are utilizing that region. Are they breeding there or not? And so this is a valuable uh, barometer because typically there's about 20 years or so in between surveys so it's a nice sort of long-term management uh, asset to us so uh, we'll get into our raptor specific ones but other grassland species are in decline 
that's not a great indicator for our raptors. So our four species we're focusing on are the short-eared owl, northern harrier, American kestrel, and barn owl. Um, they're very different in some ways, but they all rely on open grassland habitat in order for them to succeed. So short-eared owl and northern harrier, uh, it's a nice diurnal versus nocturnal crepuscular species. They rely on large open grassland meadows or pastureland. They will definitely use ag fields, um, but these two species need a lot larger areas because they actually nest on the ground. And because of that, you can't put your ground uh, nest in a small, say, you know, acre plot uh, because chances of it getting predated or found increase dramatically. If you have a windbreak of trees nearby the nest, that's inviting potential predators to be able to look right into your nest. So these two species, because of where they nest need a significant amount of grassland. And as a result, both of these are not doing great in Pennsylvania. Uh, short-eared owl is endangered in the state and Northern Harrier is threatened. So short-eared owl, owls are always charismatic. Those nice yellow eyes indicate that it is more of a crepuscular species, which means it can be seen just before dark as the sun setting, often in the winter time, you can see them coming out and uh, scoping out ag fields looking for rodents. They have four to nine eggs in a clutch. Again, they rely on tall grasses to hide the nest, which is just on the ground. So often they're found associated with either uh, warm season grass meadows or marshes where you get that higher grass vegetation to hide the nest. Um, and then they have about a five square mile area around their nest that they're actively hunting. So that's a decent patch of grassland that's necessary for these birds to successfully bring off young. It's not saying that you might not find a shorty owl in a smaller patch of grassland, but typically we're looking for a nice broad expanse of grass to support these guys. They eat small mammals primarily, and then uh, they're in decline. Uh, a study in Canada found that there was a 23% reduction uh, throughout the population there. So we are seeing similar trends, but being a nocturnal species, owls are actually relatively difficult to encounter when you're relying on uh, people submitting sightings. They're just harder to detect, not as easy to pick up. So we tend to get more sightings for our Northern Harrier and American Kestrel than our owls. Um, the breeding bird atlas data. So in the 1980s, we had 10 to 20 nesting uh, short-eared owl encounters. And then 2017, we just had two in the state of Pennsylvania, one in 2018. And uh, last year in 2019, I didn't have any uh, short-eared owls reported during the summer breeding season. We definitely have them wintering here, but people were not encountering them during the nesting season when you can presume that they're at least attempting to nest in the area. And then the Northern Harrier, this is a phenomenal species. Uh, they are sexually dimorphic with the males being these beautiful pale gray um, and then the females are a dark brown with a streaked breast. Notice that both of them display this nice bright white rump, uh, which is very distinctive. And they are often at the lookouts considered sort of pallbearer birds. Um, but what I mean by that is they have very slow wing loading, so they can get lift from very light breezes. So you often see this as an advantage uh, for grassland species that has to cover a large area hunting for rodents. Uh, so you're taking advantage of even the smallest amount of lift to reduce your energy output. So these are fun species. Typically they're low to the ground and you'll just see them uh, showing a dihedral, uh, looking for rodents. And then if they see one, they'll suddenly make a sharp acrobatic turn, dive into the grass, hopefully come up with a prey item. So charismatic species, 
sexually dimorphic. And notice uh, they're sort of uh, called an owl-like raptor, uh, harriers. They have slight facial discs uh, that you can see. And often them and short-eared owls, especially in wintering time, will utilize the same space so you can see some great interactions as they fight over food. Uh, their one to five square mile area, roughly, that will be hunted. They will use multiple patches. So if it's uh, fields interrupted by a windbreak or a small forest fragment, that's not necessarily going to deter them from utilizing that space. Um, but they do like a 30 acre, roughly, grassland area for nesting. Very site faithful. They'll return to the same uh, territory region year after year. And again, they're looking for taller grasses in marshland uh, to hide their nest because they're just putting their eggs on the ground and uh, they need to make sure the young are somewhat protected. Grassland ground nesting works great as long as there's a lot of grass that a predator would have to search through before finding the young. If this uh, bird is nesting in a hay field and the farmer sees the chicks, mows around it, well, now you have a small patch of hay in a large mown field, that can often be enough to attract predators to the area. So, uh, So it seems we're having some technical difficulties. I'm just trying to contact Bracken now to see um, maybe with the storm, um, something happened with his connection. I'm trying to contact him to see if he can log back on. So if you don't mind waiting for a moment. Thanks. He said he just lost his power. Um, okay. So I'm thinking it might be difficult for Bracken to, um, rejoin um hold on for one second Area, so uh, hopefully we can get through on my Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, but yeah, jumping, Jamie. At what point did you guys lose me? Um, or did I lose you? Yeah, whatever the last screen uh, you were on. Okay, cool. So uh, northern harrier, diurnal species, large grassland area, um, and uh, they nest on the ground returned faithfully to each site. Uh, from the breeding bird atlas data, uh, we see a 48% decline um, between 1983-89 atlas and then the 2004-2009 atlas only. So this is showing uh, the blocks. You can see there are very few green blocks, uh, which indicates it was found during both atlases. Um, and then a lot of yellow spread throughout and then shifts, uh, which is indicated by the blue. So there's interesting data you can gather from these periodic surveys. We also know um, we've been running a migration count site here in Pennsylvania uh, for the past 85 years. So we've been seeing a decline in migratory northern harriers passing us at the lookout. So this is a trend uh, that scientists can use as an indicator uh, to begin looking for what can we do to potentially adjust our management plans. Is there anything we can do? What is causing this decline or is the decline uh, reflected within the actual population or have they shifted uh, to where 
they're passing our migration lookout less. So there's a lot of potential vectors that need analysis, but the general trend is that it's in decline. Uh, two species, our other two farmland favorites here are not as bad off or declining as rapidly as our prior two. And this probably can be attributed to the fact that they're cavity nesters. So there is a lot of competition for tree hole space uh, between any species, especially like say the kestrel is currently uh, competing with European starlings for using cavity spaces. So this, uh, the fact that they're cavity nesters helps us because we can actually put up a box to attract them to an area and they don't have to rely on trying to find a suitable cavity or cavern crevice to nest in. Um, great joke is, what did you call a barn owl before people built barns? Um, they are now attributed, they occur globally and they're attributed with people nesting in people's barns, but uh, before that they would just use a tree cavity or some su such opportunity to tuck their eggs away into safety. So. Uh, American kestrel, they're declining, but we still have a lot of them in Pennsylvania, fortunately. Um, and Hawk Mountain Sanctuary has a long-term kestrel nest box program since 1950s. We've been monitoring nest boxes, and we just received monies to expand our research looking into impacts uh, that might be affecting the population in our area as well as other regions throughout their range. Barn owls also are supported by the Pennsylvania Game Commission nest box program and homeowners putting up nest boxes. So uh, very fortunate that you can put up a nesting site for either of these species right on your own property if you have the right habitat. So American kestrels, you can see we're just south of um, the summer breeding range. Uh, kestrels can be found throughout Pennsylvania all year long. So it's a great charismatic small falcon. Again, it's sexually dimorphic. This is a female kestrel on the nest box. If that was a male, it would be a blue gray uh, coloration on the top of the wing here. And they wouldn't be as speckled throughout the breast. So. Uh, it's a great sort of introductory species uh, because it's found on telephone wires hunting ag fields around the area and you can tell a little more about it through these nice colorful patterns. Um, you can keep track of your local pair if you're lucky enough to have them. They're a smaller J-sized bird, uh, so they only range about half to two miles from the nest box. And these guys are looking for rodents, insects, some birds uh, to raise nestlings successfully and then forage throughout the year. So they're hunting in grassy open areas and they readily use nest boxes. We do have a couple uh, birds in the valley that I've seen using uh, just people barns getting into a cavity or even a natural cavity in a tree still. So uh, our birds can migrate as far south as Florida we found, um, or they just spend the entire year in our region. So we'll get into that more. Revisiting the breeding bird survey for uh, the kestrel trends between 1966 and 2016, you can see that uh, in the state of Pennsylvania especially, we have a larger decrease or change in the population in our region, whereas down here in southeastern PA, there was less of a change between these survey dates. So that's already beginning to tell a story of where in the state there's available habitat. Can we back that up through our citizen scientist program? Um, coupled with migration data, we have a somewhat steady 5.3% reduction at watch sites per year. Uh, so this map is just showing different hot count sites and obviously a down red arrow, arrow is not looking good for a fall migratory bird. 
Um, there's only a couple spots where you have green, which is steady. And then uh, the graph down here is Hawk Mountain's uh, trend line for kestrels going throughout the years here. So barn owls, a farmer's friend, these are phenomenal birds. Uh, being an owl, they have a very interesting dispersal pattern. Uh, just last year, a person in the state of Pennsylvania a group maintaining some boxes trapped a bird uh, that was originally banded down in Virginia. This bird's now moved up to Pennsylvania and is breeding here. So owls are really unique because they don't necessarily follow expected patterns, but they are a farmer's friend. They rely heavily on rodents and large grassy areas, hunting pasturing uh, to feed their young. And they need large tracts of open fields. So 300 acres about is a good home range size to support a pair of barn owls. And if you think about that, there's not that many areas uh, that potentially have that available resource for the owls. They will, take advantage of a lot of nutrients and have a large clutch. Hopefully they raise all of those young if they have enough rodents to support them or might raise a portion of it. Um, but again, being a cavity or box nester is to their advantage because people can put up boxes, at least make the nesting site available. Hopefully there's the habitat associated with it to support them. And then uh, just a very unique, phenomenal bird with that, those white monkey faces, some people say, and then the beautiful brown patterning. Notice the all dark eyes. Uh, these birds have been shown to be able to navigate in essentially complete darkness. They're listening for rodents, following ro uh, the rodent sound into their prey item. This means they can hunt in the pitch black of a barn or be out in the field listening for a rodent going through the grasses there. And to successfully raise nestlings, there's that 3,000 rodent mark. Any farmer would be happy to have that uh, workforce on their property. Again, not a great report for this species. We saw a 50% decline in observations for them between the 84 and the 2004 atlases within the state. So 220 blocks, which is just the gridding uh, of the state, showed barn owl occupancies, and then 117 in the 2000s. So those are the players we're choosing to focus on. The four species that rely on grassland habitat to survive, or at least open habitat, so why are they in decline? This is the question you need to be able to answer to some respect if you're gonna have effective management or maintain a population of sorts. So primary reason is just loss of habitat. As I mentioned earlier, changes in land use are occurring, so that's reducing grasslands. Um, the Audubon Society released a grassland report and that is our most impacted uh, biome habitat or ecosystem in America right now because it's great for development, other uh, land practices. So we're seeing a rapid absorption or reapplication of the grasslands within the state. So here's a nice mixed warm season grassland meadow with some cool season grasses. This would be great for any of those four species to hunt looking for meadow voles, other rodents, or insects utilizing the space. Agriculture loss to development primarily is another big factor uh, that your typical postage stamp development with green lawns, that is not supporting a diverse prey abundance. Um, so you're going to have no food available for, for these raptors. That makes the, their ability to survive that much more difficult throughout the season. They're probably going to select for a new area as the houses move in. Um, and then this is just showing uh, from a report by Wilson et al. in 2010, change in agricultural land 
from the 1980s to 2000s here. Uh, so red, it means major shift uh, in the ag designation for the region. And as you can see, this southeastern portion, there's a lot of change occurring for the uh, designated ag land properties. And then habitat alteration. Changes in farming practices is currently evolving. We're seeing a huge reduction in pastured livestock, which cuts down on the grassland or meadow aspects to the landscape. Uh, so think post-industrial revolution, uh, you, you still probably had a lot of carriage horses and things like that needing uh, their paddock or some sort of grassland to uh, browse on. So um, we've seen an even faster decrease in actively pastured livestock in more recent years and a shift to row crops, which means you have a less diverse community. You're going to have less insects, which is in turn going to trickle up that tier function to impact what's available for the raptors to feed on in that setting. And then loss of nesting sites. Uh, so this would be a natural tree cavity where a kestrel or barn owl would nest. They might still nest, but again, there's a lot of competition for that. Barn owl sized hole, you're gonna have a raccoon maybe trying to uh, use the same space. So there's a lot of competition for a limited resource. So that's why putting up boxes is a phenomenal thing to do. And then the man-made nesting available spaces is also decreasing with cheaper sheet metal barns. That's actually reducing the spaces uh, that a barn owl or an American kestrel could actually use for a nest cavity or at least gain access into it. Uh, so that's going to negatively impact where the birds can breed. And remember, that's going to be the center of their focus throughout the summer nesting cycle, how they're going to expand their numbers. So if you lose the nest sites, you're going to eventually lose the population hanging around there. Uh, some other potential reasons, West Nile virus uh, came on the scene and that definitely had an impact. Uh, especially with kestrels that was documented and a lot of owl species uh, were negatively impacted by West Nile virus. And then just the chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, and rodenticides. Remember that as a bioindicator, you are what you eat. So by eating all of the rodents, which might be eating the insects or some sort of vegetation, you are going to get the herbicide pesticide or rodenticide actually uh, crude within the raptor's body tissue. So think about uh, a lot of people use poison for mice or other rodents. They want to get them when they're coming into the house or the barn and then they go stumbling back outside looking for water as they're dying. Well that is going to attract a raptor, a rodent stumbling out in the open is going to attract it, it's going to come in and eat it or share it with its nestlings. So poisoning is a real concern for a lot of these raptors that are using the same space as us. So what we're putting out into the ecosystem could uh, majorly impact what the raptors are uh, receiving as well. And then uh, increase in forest suburban patches that's inviting forest nesting species. So Cooper's hawks are coming back into these regions, great horned owls. Both of these are either in direct competition or going to eat some of these grassland species. So Cooper's hawk have been documented uh, eating kestrels. It's not per se a favored food source. They're not actively seeking them out. But most predators when given an opportunity are never going to say no to a meal. They're going to come in and take advantage of it. So you're going to lose some to Cooper's hawk or great horned owls. Even red tails can harass uh, the northern harrier during the daytime or if they come across the nest, uh, snatch a chick up. So a uh, little more on the chemical side of things, uh, Roundup or glyphosate. This is just showing uh, agricultural use for it. This was published in 2011. 
Um, and often farmers put out neonicotinoids uh, for insecticides, which again, it's uh, considered safer than something like uh, the organophosphates uh, like DDT, but it is having an impact. So we need to be aware of that and actively trying to answer these questions. What is safe levels? How big of an impact is it having? Can we find something better? Um, and then the bottom chart there is just showing use of the glyphosate by crop uh, through the years. So you can see there's a dramatic increase uh, since the early 90s, shifting into it. So if you're putting it out into the ecosystem, it's there uh, as it's active. How is that interacting with the food chain? And is it going to have long-lasting long negative effects on the raptors that are feeding on insects or insects that ate plants with it, or insects that are being hit with an insecticide, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so it's a gray, dark day outside suddenly, and I've been sort of focusing on dreary declines. Uh, just to wrap that up, uh, we have declining populations within the state. Some are threatened and endangered. We have a lack of survey data, remember, uh, those graphs I showed you, uh, which map the state out, I mean, there's 20 years between those data points. So if we wait another 20 years for our next data point, that's a long time. A lot can happen within the ecosystem between here and then. So uh, we need to step up our game and collect this data uh, so we can implement uh, land management practices and hopefully mitigate some of these negative declines. Um, and a huge factor of this is a lot of the land used by these birds is privately owned. So how can we get the private sector involved in conserving these species? Um, so we need to engage landowners in conservation. Best way to do that is through knowledge. The more you know about something or interact, uh, say we put a kestrel nest box up on someone's private property, invite them out when we're processing the chicks, they have that instant connection. They want to see that bird doing well on their property, on their neighbor's property. So you can facilitate uh, conservation pretty rapidly through establishing a connection and sharing information uh, for food species. So farmland raptors was sort of birthed out of all of this. And our goal is to empower and involve landowners. This isn't a project where Biologists are going out and collecting all of the data and then saying uh, we need to do this in order to achieve that. It is primarily driven to educate the landowners, get them to share data with us, and then we can relatively easily say, you know what, this is where we're at within the state. These are the trends we're seeing how can we use this data to further ensure that these birds are around for everyone to enjoy? Um, and the biggest thing is these birds really do benefit, especially the ag community, um, but anyone who sees harrier hunting, say it's uh, along the coast in the winter time or your own uh, field out back, your neighbor's field, they're a delight to watch uh, hunt Kestrels are nice and charismatic. Everyone loves them now. So it's, it's easy, or it should be easy, to make these connections and get people involved. So not only are we helping them, they're helping us because they're preying on a uh, species we consider a potential pest um, and benefiting us in many other ways. Uh, so the biggest thing is maintain large undisturbed grassland habitats where possible, especially for those uh, ground nesting birds. This is a northern harrier nest. Uh, delay mowing until July 15th or later. So typically in the calendar year, the species will be wrapped up as far as um, the young will be getting ready to fledge by mid-July for those short-eared and northern harriers. That's not a hard date. But if it's something like mowing your cow pasture and birds are using it, 
if you can delay until after July 15th, you're going to ensure that they have that leg up to get their young off uh, versus mowing and other distress or exposing the young. Uh, now, with warmer springs, when people are getting the first cutting hay off, that becomes less realistic to wait until July 15th, but there's a lot of uh, pasture land that could be delayed for mowing. Um, for the cavity nesters, just increasing the number of boxes in proper habitat. Don't put up a box in the middle of the woods, put it up alongside a field or out in the open um, is huge for increasing the species. If there's available space, someone's probably going to come along and use it. And then educating the public, getting them engaged in monitoring and taking conservation actions in the area. You can start your own box, nest box monitoring for friends um, and submit your data to either us or uh, the Pennsylvania Game Commission. If it's a barn owl using your uh, land, they would love to come out and uh, probably ban them because that's a declining raptor in our state of Pennsylvania. So as I said, Pennsylvania Game Commission has plans out for you to build your own barn owl box. They love hearing from you and uh, finding a new spot to place an appropriate box in the habitat. A huge thing is getting people started young. Raptors hit people differently at any age, but the younger you are, I was six when I got hooked by farmland raptors, and a lot of school age students uh, really respond well to raptors when they're getting stared down by a kestrel or an owl in the hand. Uh, they just have this sense of awe and they want to do something. So involving students and building nest boxes is a great way to just expand uh, people's contact with the species. We're seeing uh, great progress in getting uh, curriculums implemented in the classroom. So Kutztown High School uh, is close to the sanctuary here. They've been making boxes and they'll actually monitor some of them uh, over the years. But engaging younger generation, future farmers association, that is going to take conservation forward uh, rather than just trying to educate the people there now, try to hit the community at as many levels as possible. And part of this is just getting education materials out there. You may have seen some of our signs over the years. We have a lot of them. Um, hopefully we get the money to print some more and get them out there, some of our updates. All of this is just geared to inform the public so they can take actions in their areas. Um, you might find at a local ag or fair, uh, we're restricting some of, uh, or the number of public events we've been doing just because of resources for the project. But if you see us come up, chat with us, any of us who are manning the booth would love you. Take any of our information down, We'll take yours if you have the right habitat. We want to hear from you and get a box up for you to monitor as soon as possible. And again, here's our Fantastic Four for the farmlands. Um, and they are just a charismatic bunch that we hope to see in Pennsylvania long term. Um, and we always want to recognize this project is based on the landowners and people reciting birds. Uh, but landowners, especially because without their permission, you're not going to put boxes up and get monitoring. So we really rely on property holders to support our efforts. Uh, this is sort of our breakdown of who we interact with as far as the project. You can see it's been pretty between landowners, observers, and infor information requests. Someone Googled us, want to know more. And then, of course, there's very small amount of buy-in, but we love all of our supporters that are willing to donate time or money to support these efforts. But we do uh, reach a diverse community, is what this is showing, and that community is spread throughout the state. Uh, we do have a general concentration down in the southeast. Blue is a landowner, 
interaction, and then red is a uh, person who's observed a bird somewhere. And then uh, just looking at some of the data we've collected with the project since it started. So for Northern Harrier and Short-Eared Owl sightings, uh, I should say at this point that eBird is our number one sort of data collector. Everyone's getting involved in this effort. They can submit their sightings. Uh, it's already geolocated to their region. So we do a data request from eBird at the end of the year, and they will share all of their sightings for these four species that we can then use to generate land use uh, throughout the state by season for these species. So uh, you do see a negative trend 2012 through 2014, and then eBird hits the scene, and we do see a jump in sightings. It's just the citizen scientist collaboration aspect took hold, so more people were getting to share their data, whereas before they might have to search to find who to report this to, and that's going to bottleneck uh, how many reports you're actually receiving. So eBird is a phenomenal website if you don't have it. They have a cell phone version that you can download. So I highly recommend submit your data. They will protect the endangered uh, species information, especially if it's during the breeding season. So they're not going to post it or make it public. But do report your sightings uh, so that scientists can then go in, data mine, and we can look at habitat in the state. So this is last data. Looking at barn owls, I should say uh, we had, for 2019, we had 12,018 species reports uh, from eBird alone, and then 254 additional reports directly to us for all four of our species. Barn owl, they're not found many places throughout the state, and notice a lot of the winter and summer are quite close to each other, so uh, that is uh, just aspect of it could be there in the same habitat throughout the year or are these new birds coming in? These are questions you'd have to then go out and collect additional data to actually answer. But we do have uh, documentation of barn owls throughout the state. If we look at Northern Harrier for last year, we have a couple regions uh, that were popular during the breeding season. And then the blue dots are all the winter season or non-breeding encounters. So that does include migration. So from August, beginning of August roughly through March um, is non-breeding. And then the red is breeding habitat. If you have successful breeding within the state, you want to make sure that that area gets some sort of protection or special um, assessment as far as this is high quality habitat that can support a population versus I saw a bird flying past the subdevelopment in the middle of winter well that bird could be transient or passing between ag fields so uh, the breeding season data is really valuable at this point um, but also getting that non-breeding where the birds dispersing to Last year, we only had non-breeding encounters for short-eared owls. You can see uh, there were not a lot of them. Uh, but again, we have sort of the southeast corner and then using the valley regions of the Ridge and Valley region, and then going out west, Presque Isle, and the western portions of the state, there's more open ag land or grassland, so the species tend to be there rather than to see them using the more forested region. So already we're getting a selection of preferred habitat. So this is American kestrels, which I think we had uh, close to 9,000 sightings of those sightings reported were just for kestrels. Easily recognizable. See highly faithful to the valleys portion where there's ag land um, spread out in the southeast here and then decent numbers throughout, I think each and every county has had Kestrel reports. And then uh, the wintering 
range of the American kestrel. Again, this is showing that they're relying on Pennsylvania in both the breeding and the non-breeding cycles. So what is working? Where are they using within the state? This data is collecting that uh, so you can run a more rigorous scientific analysis. Uh, so our two primary ground nesters, the Northern Harrier and Short-Eared Owl, just looking at what type of habitat they're selecting for, uh, high in this case is three or four birds per site. So site visit can be a range of area. But notice both are looking at either ag land or a lot of grassland and they're actively seem to be avoiding the development area. So they, these species really need a nice open vista grassland habitat to support them, they're preferring it. So what we've learned in this project is regular outreach, checking in with the public is key for maintaining these efforts. Uh, eBird is a phenomenal resource, but again, it has limitations. Detectability for owls often they overlook, so you have to be conscious of weaknesses as well as strengths within the data set. Um, and then more can always be done with educating landowners, primarily through the ag communities that own the majority of this grassland or open habitat. Uh, PA is an important site, wintering site for all four of these species. And we need to partner with landowners to improve our outreach effort and make sure that we're doing as much as we can within the community to support these raptors. Uh, we're always looking to expand our volunteers and collaborators, uh, find funding to maintain uh, programs, travel, mailing, promote uh, crep and grass and set asides for landscape, and then education and beginning to collect data on impacts that pesticides and rodenticides are having, as well as continuing to compile this database because data is the most valuable. It can tell the story. Uh, so by doing a broad spectrum of data collection, we're building a very nice database that you can then analyze uh, to answer some scientific questions. Um, we really appreciate all of our donors. Without you, the project isn't possible. Um, if you would like to become a donor, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and then just, this is a village or community effort in all respects. So huge shout out to people who are sending us photos, encounters, sharing their stories. We love hearing from you. And if you'd like to uh, learn more about this project, get some of our information links, we might have a Kestrel box for you. Feel free to reach out to me at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Uh, you can find me uh, on our website, or here's my contact information. And then I will say, if you see a short-eared owl and a northern harrier during the summer, we really want to hear about that data because that's a good indicator that they might be breeding in that region. Uh, so here's a winter picture of, of them sort of competing over a vault. Uh, but yeah, if you see either a northern harrier short-eared owl, observe the, the birds, enjoy the experience, and then please uh, contact us and let us know where you're seeing these birds. We'd love to hear about that. Sorry I ran a little long, but uh, I guess I'll go back to my information slide while we answer questions. So. Awesome, Bracken, thank you so much for such an inspiring presentation. That was wonderful. Um, we do have one question right now. It seems that family farms and particularly organic or potential organic farmers are a strong cohort on which to focus. Can you please comment on this? Yes, uh, we are definitely uh, targeting in on organic farm practices as being preferential just because of the reduced chemical use. Uh, we recently attended the uh, Pennsylvania Sustainable Agriculture uh, event uh, right before the virus outbreak. Um, so we are always intrigued by organic farms. 
a lot of the operations that I've gone out and seen, um, unfortunately, tend to be somewhat smaller sized operations that are within sort of a fragmented forested landscape. So that's not as suitable a habitat uh, for kestrels to use, but we definitely appreciate organic farm practices uh, for the sake of these raptors and we hope that they continue to increase and expand in size so we have more available habitat that is chemical free for these birds. Do you collaborate with the Rodale Institute at all? Yes, um, we definitely share reports between us and Rodale. Uh, so that's an excellent example of education, outreach, you're building your community and strengthening connections. Uh, we all need to get as many people aware of it as possible. Uh, so then uh, we increase not only our data set, but our ability to monitor the species. Thank you so much, Bracken. Did you want to try to quickly share um, the view from Hawk Mountain's website as to how people can make a sightings report if they see a farmland raptor on their property? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me go to... I did have this up. Um, hold on a moment. So yeah, if you have uh, farmland raptors in your area, there we go, um, and you want to report your sightings, uh, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary would love to hear from you. And to do this, you simply type in hawkmountain.org. You'll get to our homepage here. And over here under science, and resources, you can see Raptor Sighting Report Forms. Click on that and that will direct you over here and you have a array of options for our marked projects, Farmland Raptors Report a Sighting. Um, and it's just fill in the tabs as you go. You'll get informed if you're missing information, but it's uh, straightforward. So say I saw an American Kestrel today, how many you saw, what behavior they're doing, was it perched beside the road, flying, uh, was it carrying food item, entering a nest, what habitat, how large was the grassland associated. Um, you can add multiple sightings at one time. You can upload photos or videos. We love, especially some of our marked individuals, uh, we love to get photo documentation of that because that can be used in our information plat uh, platforms. And then your information or the landowner information will generate a record docket that we can use uh, in our database as well as maintaining communication. We do issue a annual newsletter. Uh, typically it goes out in the early spring and it just presents those maps I showed you. That's the main data uh, from the project where we presented and some additional information. Always make sure to select I'm not a robot uh, before you submit your data and that will generate a report that will come across our desk. Uh, if you don't know the lat long, over here you can see there's the geo picker. And I don't know if this will show, does the pop out window show for you, Jamie? Um, I don't see it. Okay, um, so the geo picker just uh, creates uh, essentially a Google Maps. So you can see the street view. You can then drop a pin where you saw the bird and that will automatically fill out the lat long coordinates for where that sighting was. Uh, but again, we would love to hear from you. I always enjoy talking about these species. And right now we're doing that drive for Northern Harrier Short-Eared Owl summer sightings. So if you're fortunate enough to come across them, please reach out, let me know, or uh, report your sightings of any of our Fantastic Four. And here's to uh, getting to observe them in Pennsylvania for the next uh, 
length of time. So. Thanks, Bracken, and they are quite the fantastic four. And I know we're coming to a close of our time, but more questions are coming in. I'm gonna to try to squeeze in um, one or two more if you can give a quick uh, response. How much territorial overlap exists between or within these uh, species? Um, so they'll use, uh, typically they'll use the same habitat and notice we have two diurnal, which means they hunt during the day, two nocturnal, hunt at night, that limits interaction. Um, there have been some documented cases of uh, kestrels and barn owls trying to use the same box that ends poorly for the kestrel, uh, but there's a lot of overlap. These grassland species will use the same area um, depending on the richness of it. Thank you. And the last question, what about county and state properties? Are, is Hawk Mountain able to have them preserve grasslands? Uh, excellent question. So uh, part of this database we're collecting is uh, to inform management practices. Uh, so we definitely hope that uh, county and state land is going to take advantage of it. And, you know, simple things like when you mow can have a massive impact. Uh, for example, a lot of people were mowing horse pastures that had bobolink uh, nest colonies in them, and they were, you know, the grass got a little long, they mowed it middle of June, that's when uh, chicks are in the nest. That is a complete loss of that colony's productivity for that period. So just informing people that bird that's angrily flying around you, there's a reason for it, can you delay? And a lot of uh, landowners are more than happy to delay by a couple weeks. Nestlings are free flying at that point. They can move around the mower and often uh, they'll more than happily eat all the insects the mower is kicking up. So yes, we're hoping that the, we're informing state and uh, land management practices with our information. Thank you so much, Bracken. And what an important project for conservation and thank you for doing this work and for the whole team. Um, it's, it's fantastic, and, and I hope that the viewers enjoyed it. Thank you so much to our audience for joining us on this stormy uh, late afternoon, stormy in Pennsylvania anyway. I know we have people joining from all over. And Bracken, thank you as always. You give awesome presentations. Thank you so much. We have many more virtual programs coming your way in the next week. And so here, here's um, what you have to look forward to. Next Wednesday, June 3rd, we have Wonders of Wildflowers at 1 o'clock p.m. Next Friday, June 5th, we have Voyages of the Snowy Owl at 4 o'clock p.m. And also next Thursday, June 4th, we have Rosalie Edge, Raptor Hero at 1 o'clock p.m. And then the following week, Wednesday, June 10th, we have Slithering Snakes at 1 o'clock p.m. On Thursday, June 11th, we have Sanctuary Storytime Percy the Victorious Vulture at 11 o'clock a.m. And on Friday, June 12th, we have Galaxy of Falcons at 4 o'clock p.m. So we hope to see you all again soon and have a fantastic weekend. And thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon or whatever time it is where you are. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone.